All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to session uh, the tech up or the <laughs> welcome to the tech update session for Citrix Virtual Labs and Desktop. My name is Thomas. I'm part of the technical marketing team based out of Switzerland. And with me on stage on his first Synergy session ever, Mayank. <laughs> Hi. No uh, pressure. Well, I'm sure a lot of you have been <laughs> expecting Dan to be here. Uh, he is my manager. And yes, he's now not technical anymore. He's just managing. So he's got a 10 session uh, Geek's Guide to the Workspace that he's running right next door. And I think we're uh, up against him. So thank you for coming here and choosing yeah. to listen to us. Yeah. Thomas, take it away. All right, good. Um, if you would like to tweet about the session, um, please just tweet positive things about us. Um, uh, these are the hashtags to make sure we can actually find it. And um, yeah, honestly, we would love to take all the fame or all the kudos for this presentation. But in reality, um, most of the things you see is not our work. I mean, we put in some work into the slides, but actually it's a combination of, of the input of a lot of people. You see a lot of Citrix employees there, then Fella obviously being one of them who kind of started all of this tech update. But there's also external partners which contributed in this case, um, Login BSI and ICTR. We have a, a few slides from them, and you will see their logo so that we make sure everyone gets the kudos for the, for the work they spend into this. All right, so let's quickly um, get started, because we have, uh, in good old tradition, a million slides we have to go through. So Windows 10, obviously the foundation for pretty much all, or I want to say most, large majority of VDI deployments in the CVAT world. Uh, and Windows 10 is, is great operating system, everything is great, but it has caused, obviously, a few headaches. And not so much around, uh, not so much around ap application compatibility or new UI or anything like that. The key problem for most of the customers, especially for customers in or large customers, customers in regulated industries, is the fast release cycle, right? Adopting their IT operational processes to Windows 10 has been a challenge. Quick show of hands for my own interest. Who has had challenges adopting the IT processes for, for Windows 10? A few. Who still has challenges? Still a few. OK, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> so, um, so operational challenge is obviously one of the, one of the key things. Um, but there, has, there are other challenges with Windows 10 too. And I'm not talking about the, let's say, suboptimal hotfixes, which has been released recently. Um, but um, it's scalability. If we take a look at the scalability graphs, and you're going to see a lot of those graphs, so I just walk you quickly through them. Obviously, it's a graph, nothing new. Um, it's, in this case, at the top, you usually see what we are looking at. In this case, it's going to be Windows 10, and we're looking at the available memory uh, graph. And what we've been using for all the tests is login VSI as the test metric. And in, in the vast majority, it, using the login, uh, the knowledge worker, login VSI knowledge worker workload. That's a little more performance intense or resource intensive than the task worker, just for your information. If there's something, some deviation from that, in case there's some optimization or some other workloads being tested, then it's being pointed out. All right, so let's focus on Windows 10 and the challenges. Obviously, so this, this is uh, Windows 10 15 11 release few years ago. And then from there, the resource consumption only increased, right? So this is the next release, next release, kind of hit it, and then we go down. The only release which kind of went up a bit is the 1809, which is kind of the last release. I mean, this morning or last yesterday, they released 1903, and we haven't got around to test it yet. Um, so we will see if that will increase any of that. But obviously, this increase of performance, and this is quite a bit. I mean, if you look at the scale, this is quite a few hundreds of megabytes of change um, that on a large scale deployment has quite some impact. Um, and, and one of the reasons, obviously, for this is that there's a lot more going on under the hood of Windows 10. So this is uh, all the Windows releases, top to bottom. Um, there's not so much on change on default apps, but a lot more services and a lot more scheduled tasks to run. Obviously, there's things we can do, we can optimize, and we could get to that later on. But out of the box, there's a lot more going on. Hence, there's a lot more resource consumption. We'll see how 1903 will perform if they change the way. And we looked at memory. CPU utilization is the same thing. This is a slide from Login DSI. Um, you see that this gray line that is the number of users logging on into the system. And as more users logged in, we see the CPU uh, increasing. These are the versions uh, going in chron chronological order. And um, as we get closer to today, they get, bad, uh, get, get worse. One big issue is coming with the last release. And that's OneDrive. You see, that's like quite a bit of a different thing. If we remove OneDrive, then we get a lot closer. So OneDrive is really a performance hog. And um, it's great. It does a lot of great things. I mean, I think ShareFile or Citrix File is a lot cooler, but that's my opinion. Um, but it's a performance hog. 
and you need to uh, really pay attention to it if you want to have it run in, which is default, or if you disable it. Um, the same thing is with logon times. So if we look at uh, a similar chart, we log on users. The more users on the system, the higher the pressure on the system, the login times goes up. That's, that's what is expected. And the more we get closer to today, um, the more resource intensive are they. And we, again, see OneDrive has quite a bit of an impact from a resource perspective. So Windows 10 is a great OS. It has a few challenges operational need, from an operational perspective, but also from a resource perspective. We need to pay attention to that. If we look into the Windows Server world, um, we see a very similar thing. I'm not going to walk you through all of these things, but CPU goes up as we go towards 2019. Uh, memory and uh, disk I.O. is kind of up and down. But it's, uh, there's certainly a, a bit of a performance impact. Obviously, we wanted to understand like, in depth what is the imp impact if I go from 2012 or 2 to 2016, because that is one of the area of projects our consulting teams are uh, in all the time. And what we did here is we uh, created a baseline with 20, uh, 2012 R2. That's the blue line. Um, uh, the, it's on the, on the left side. And the blue line is just default optimization or default implementation. Um, the orange bar, this is, uh, was a new version of ThinWire, so the HDX protocol underneath, it's using the ThinWire, uh, the ThinWire codec, so they did a few optimizations there. The blue bar is what we really need to look at. And as we go to Windows, 6, 16, Windows Server 2016, we see about 15%, um, round about a 15% ballpark uh, reduction in single server scalability. Um, the good news is, if we look into 2016 to 2019, again, another slide from Login VSI, they did a few tests there. One test was with Office 2016, the other one was with Office 2019. Um, the single server scalability impact is just 4%. So this is quite promising, right? We don't have too much customers really did the jump already into 2019. Um, so we'll see if that holds true in the real world. But this is uh, an, a, a good indication of uh, that Microsoft took this uh, into account quite a bit. All right. Want to go first? Go sure. All right. So when we talk about the difference between Windows 10 and 2016, we wanted to take a look at what is the actual difference between the server operating system and the Windows 10 actual desktop operating system. And if you've heard about it, we are actually going into the Windows virtual desktops option where it is actually a multi-session operating system. So if you guys want to know more about which is the option that you should choose for your VDI, we have a session tomorrow uh, at 1.30 that I am doing as part of the Geek's Guide to the Workspace where we go over all the different options that are available. And if you guys want, you could come and take a look at that session. It will be right over in the next ballroom. So quickly going over the different uh, CPU usage of a task worker versus a knowledge worker and the different uh, optimizations that we do was with Windows 10 versus Windows Server 2016, we can see that the CPU usage is almost half every time versus uh, 2016 Windows 10 is always more. But on the bandwidth consumption side, it is almost the same. So if you're looking for any workloads that are more CPU intensive, then you want to make, maybe move to a, to a server 2016 uh, versus a Windows 10. And obviously, since WVD is not GA yet, we haven't benchmarked that piece out yet, but we soon will as well. Uh, hand back to you. Yeah. So unfortunately, we don't have a graph here for uh, Windows 10 multi-user. Yeah, that would be great. Cool. It's 20, 20 to 30 percent right impact on over scalability. So that's obviously another way of, uh, of creating a desktop for the user. So Delivering a desktop to the user, it's obviously usability or, or uh, application compatibility and so on, as we learn tomorrow. And performance can also have an impact. By the way, that um, what is it, the 10 parts guide to the Citrix workspace? Geek's guide to the workspace, That's 10 part it, sessions. Yeah. Next door, it's really cool. They talk to all the different layers and all the different design decisions. And actually, I believe there are really people sitting there like two and a half or one and a half days is all the sessions, one or the other, and, and get the full, the full thing. It's, uh, I think it's pretty cool stuff. Anyway, let's get going and let's look into optimizations. I mean, so far we've looked a lot at scalability graphs and uh, the default configurations, except for removing OneDrive in some cases. Um, now let's have a look into optimizations a bit. But I'm, I have to disappoint you again. Uh, we're not talking about individual or actual optimizations. There is a great session for that. So we removed it from this one. 
This is uh, running later today. Martin Zugek and Rob Zulowski are running 45 minutes talking through all the different optimizations you can apply and what the individual impact is on each of them. So if, you, if, if scalability optimization is your thing, make sure you go there. I think it's repeated tomorrow as well. I'm not exactly sure, but I think tomorrow afternoon we're going to have that session again. So, but one thing, obviously, we have a few things we have to share anyway. Optimizations. There is, optimization is more of an art than a science in many cases. And um, there is, uh, I think, just a few years ago, there were hundreds of pages of recommendations for optimizations, and everyone has their own little personal twist to it. Um, and obviously, you can still do that, but it, it's hardly repeatable and stuff. So all the vendors, uh, all, all the um, virtual app and desktop vendors, I want to say, have created their own optimization engine, and Citrix has the optimization engine as well. Martin Zugek is kind of the, the mind behind the Citrix Optimizer. That is an awesome tool in case you haven't checked it out. This is the thing you should do. It comes with a, a, a ton of templates. It also has a, a marketplace in there where you can pick the optimization template for your operating system uh, uh, and uh, your build you're using, and it recommends quite a few things. And it comes with a few cool functionalities. Obviously, you can take a template, so you install Optimizer, you can take a template, and you can just analyze your system and compare it against what the template would recommend and what you actually have configured. So you get kind of a delta analysis. Then you can obviously say, I want to execute it, um, and then you optimize it in whatever shape or form you have uh, configured the optimizer for. Or, and that's pretty awesome, it has a rollback function. It requires a bit of PowerShell usage, but you actually can say all the things I just applied I want to roll back to whatever state I had before. So in case you're doing some sort of an A-B testing and the one, one way wasn't good enough, then you can roll it back with that tool as well. The optimizer in general has a very broad vision. So it's supposed to be like a framework for analyzing, configuring, and optimizing pretty much all the components of the Citrix stack. At the moment, and, and it's going to be more like a, the vision for it, it will be kind of a Swiss army knife for everything. At the moment, it's more like this. It does one thing, and it does that thing really well, which is the really optimizing the performance of the operating system. This is what it's all about. So it's going to grow over time, but it's not, it's not there today. It's pretty popular already, so it's the second most popular download on support, um, and, it's, and it's really awesome. And in case you haven't seen it this morning, Martin just pushed another version. It adds a whole th slew of new things, and in case you want to you always wanted to use your QR reader application on your phone. This is the time to do so. It gets you straight to the website where you can download the new version. Unfortunately, you can't install it on your phone, but who wants to install things? Um, so the optimizer is pretty cool. And just to get you an idea of uh, that optimizations actually can do something, another performance chart. And what we have here is uh, we test Windows 10. We have, for the baseline, we have already removed OneDrive um, just to get it somewhere close. And, um, it can make an impact. So if we run the knowledge worker workload and just apply the default settings of Optimizer, we get about 15% less CPU usage. We get about 19% less memory consumption and 9% uh, less of disk write. So performance optimizations matter. On Windows 10, the same thing is true for Windows Server. So what we have here, it's another login VSI chart. And what we have here is we see that difference. They have also done a similar test like we did. What is the impact, the performance impact, if you go from Windows Server 2012 uh, R2 to 2016? And they came up with 15%. For us, it was somewhere in the 13 to 17%, so pretty much around the same ballpark. If we apply all the optimizations, then we can reduce that impact to about 8%. So optimizations are a pretty cool thing, and they really can make an impact. So it's worth investing time and thoughts into it. Obviously, there's one thing um, or a few things we have to keep in mind, and that is all the tests we're doing is using Login VSI. And Login VSI is a really good tool to figure out a baseline and to, and to test new hardware or to test, um, figure out what instance types you should use on a, on a, uh, on a, cloud, on a cloud server. But it, but it really has uh, a challenge in that it is, is that it is a repeatable workload, right? All the users do use all the same apps in the same way. There is some randomization in it, but it's not really mimicking what users are doing. So our users use different apps at different types. Sometimes there is an overlap, sometimes there is not. Um, application crashes um, 
are not mimicked there as well. Um, there is, uh, it, it's not really paying attention to any kind of misconfigured agents, virus scanners, or anything like that, which might be in a real world implementation. Usually, you test login VSI with like a vanilla system. You install it; it does all the all its magic it requires, and you don't really install things on top of that. And obviously, it doesn't pay doesn't help you understand the impact of um, real-world um, situations. Like uh, you, have a, you have a runaway process, so something runs at 100% all the time for individual user, or some sort of excessive login storms. So this is things we have to, we have to keep in mind that login VSI really just gets us just an indication, but it never is a replacement for an actual real-world test. There are customers um, which kind of try to do kind of a multi-stage testing, if you like, so they start testing optimizations or new versions of Windows 10 or whatever you want to test, like in a test bed with this to get an indication of which direction it's going. And then they dedicate a few users uh, in, in production which run that new build. So it's kind of a canary rollout, if you like. So it's just like 1% of your user population, depending on how big you are. And then they test it and they see how much the deviation is from the can test with login VSI to the actual results in reality. And then they roll it out or roll it back. And just dedicating a few users on this um, obviously limits the impact, right? So you not want to do this and say, okay, I tested everything, now I want to run. One last thing I want to, want to mention here is workspace environment management, right? It's not an optimization tool in a traditional sense, but it has, a, has a, uh, a, the CPU and memory optimization functionality built in. I hope you have discovered that already. So what it can do, it can help me that my processes which are running um, use the CPU more efficiently, also that uh, processes which are not active at the moment are offloaded to disk and don't sit in the active memory. And what we see here on the screen is uh, screenshots from a uh, European customer. And uh, what, we, what it helped us there is the, the purple line is the uh, processor queue length. And when we enable uh, the CPU optimization functionality, the processor queue length goes down. That means we can also increase the uh, actual CPU utilization. And from a user perspective, what it resulted in them, it's better response time within the session, and the customer was actually able to add more users onto the system. So WEM really can make an impact. It really depends on what you do, um, and it really depends on how the applications are working. So it's really hard to get a ballpark number of what you, what you can expect. Usually, if, if we don't know anything, I would say somewhere between 10 and 20% more users should be there. We, I, we have a French customer. They have some weird homegrown applications. They get 80% more users on it, but I want to say the application is probably not fully optimized. Um, uh, but it certainly makes things um, better. One thing, uh, one, uh, one interesting combination, because we talked a lot about login VSI. If you do login VSI, uh, a test run, and you enable CPU optimization of WEM, you're not going to see an impact. Um, the reason is the optimization on a WEM system um, is happening on a schedule. I think it's every, every two minutes or every five minutes or something like that. It does something. But login VSI is opening and closing the applications at a faster pace. So in the moment we detect something and want to optimize it, that state has already changed. That's obviously not how users work. They keep, tend to have an Outlook open longer than a minute. But that's, so you're not going to see a login VSI dent uh, if, when, when testing this. All right, so let's go up the stack. We talked about the operating systems quite a bit. Now let's take a look into what uh, virtual app and desktop releases, what the scalability impact is there. So what we have here uh, is, uh, again, it's Windows 10. It is um, all the different versions of, uh, of virtual apps and desktops until 1903, and this is the task worker. And we see one cool th trend, it's going down. So. Um, the going down, the reason is largely, and we're going to see something along, uh, late, around that later on, is we did a lot of investment in making the HDX protocol more efficient. And we're going to see a few examples of what that means and what we did under the hood to get there. But it's also, we, take a lo we took a long, hard look into all the other services the VDA brings and reduced it. So from a CPU perspective, it goes down for the task worker workload, for the knowledge worker workload, same thing. It goes, it goes down, down quite a bit. So adopting... Uh, the latest current release only gets you, not only gets you more features and fixes, but also a higher scalability on the system. Um, if we look at memory, so same thing, Windows 10, same workload, um, we can see a similar thing, although not as pronounced as with CPU. So CPU was the, was the core thing um, we did. Um, in general, or overall, we see about 25% improvement 
when moving from the 715 LTSR to 1903 current release. So this is, pretty, this is pretty cool. What is nice is, and this is a slide we got from ICTR down there, they did a similar test and they came to a similar conclusion. What you see on the left is uh, 70, uh, 715. It's the blue and the orange. And on the very right hand side, the dark blue, this is 1811. So between those versions, it's about 30% more users fit onto a system. So there is external validation that really scalability is an issue is, is, an, is a topic for us and we reinvest in it so when you adopt the latest CR you might get some of the performance back you lost when patching uh, for spectra or meltdown patches just by going for the latest CR all right so sizing moving into sizing really quick um, sizing again is an art and uh, uh, always one of the most asked questions is how many user get I, do I get on a system closely followed by how many, mem how many bandwidth does my user require for, HD uh, for HDX. So those two questions always come up. And um, there's all sorts of magic you can do. One thing Nick Rintalen came up with is the rule of five and 10. And this is pretty simple, but it's amazingly accurate. Uh, so essentially how the rule of five and 10 works is if you wanna figure out how many users you get on a virtual app and desktop or up system, then you just take the cores you have and multiply them by 10. So you have 28 cores, you multiply them by 10, you will end up somewhere in the 280 users per machine uh, 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 ballpark. If you do it for VM, you just multiply the cores by five. Um, he had uh, in, in the slides uh, from uh, Nick, and he has actually he run a session recently where he walked through all the different, he had 10 examples of real world customers. And he was, I think the actual average across all the customers was um, five and 9.7 or something, what the rule recalled. So this is five and 10 is really amazingly accurate. Um, now there's one very important thing when talking about sizing the systems, and this is how the CPUs have evolved late, recently. So in the past, well, not that long ago, CPUs were, uh, had, had, a, had a thing which was called NUMA nodes. So if you, if you look at a CPU, you have a core, each core has a memory, and there's a bus in between. As we add more cores, those cores all use the same bus to get to the memory. As you go beyond a certain point, that bus becomes a bottleneck. Um, what did the CPU vendors do? They split the CPU in halves. So you get one NUMA node, which has a, which multiple cores share a bus and a piece of memory, and on the other side, you have the same thing. Now, if you happen to have like a VM, which has more CPU requirements than one of those NUMA nodes can do, then that VM spilled across to the other NUMA node and you suddenly had a very slow memory access for those cores. The NUMA threshing happened and then the performance went down quite a bit. So usually you add more resources, the performance goes up. At some point, it actually went down. That is because that memory access was too slow. Um, for, for Skylake processors, this changed. They now have a mesh and that mesh allows uh, fast access for all the cores to all areas of the memory. So this restriction went away. So what is our recommendation for sizing if we start with something? This is what uh, we do for VDI. I'm not gonna read it out for you. Uh, I think this is just a starting point. For Windows Server, this was the important piece, is for CPUs, we always sized for one full NUMA node or half a NUMA node, not going beyond that and not using some odd numbers because otherwise you might have this NUMA threshing happening. This is for the older CPUs, obviously. For newer CPUs, this whole thing goes away. I mean, memory sizing and stuff is still there, but the, mem the CPU piece is going away. At the, now, we size around operational things. Obviously, we can create a massive, ma massive VM which has like hundreds of users on them. The challenge is what happens if you're gonna maintain it or if it goes down for some other reason. So the failure domain is huge. So you wanna keep it small. So then it really comes down to your operational requirements what you would like to do. So it really is your thing. I think at the moment we don't really have a best practice, but um, we, uh, uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, uh, we, I think we just used the starting points we had in the past. So moving on, scalability in the cloud. We have, um, uh, obviously the big question is uh, on premise is nice, but how do I size in the cloud? So we did uh, same login VSI loads across all the different instance types on Azure and the F16 series, um, holds the most users. But obviously the function in the cloud is what is, uh, what is the cost associated with each user. So if we take that and multiply it by the cost, then we end up with this. And at the end of the day, the F16S is our favorite. The reason for that is you get the most bang for the buck and each user is somewhere around the two cent per hour uh, in this case. So it's pretty, pretty awesome. So how about HDX? Oh no. no we got a few more. How about HDX? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so 
I'm here to talk to you about all the optimizations that we've done with HDX and how it actually impacts the user performance and how it, you can make your users get the best experience even if you just tweak policies inside of, op, the op, uh, inside of Citrix policies. So the first thing to note is that applications themselves are not constant. The amount of traffic that gets get sent over the wire for even a single application could just vary based on what you're doing with it. So for an example, when you're presenting, like we are, you can see the, all those spikes. If you're creating an, a PowerPoint, it's flat. The amount of data that's going through is very less. Can, any, any idea why they're spiking? Anybody? Nope, it's just moving one slide to the other. <laughs> this is the amount of data that's getting pushed across the network when you just move one from one slide to the other. So every time that you're seeing something that's happening on the screen, we have to change, we have to compress, we have to send it across to the network, and that is what ma makes a difference. Uh, looking at average bandwidth usage on 2016, every application is different. So if you have PowerPoint versus Word, you will see that across the board on every version, Word is using much, much lesser. Why is that? Because we are able to compress the content which is there in Word because of our different technologies much better than the images that are there inside of the PowerPoint presentation. So what we would like to give you to take away is that this is a set of policies if you have the two different use cases. One, where you want to give your users the best performance, that is the user experience set of policies, and one where you have a latency, that is the WAN, WAN set of policies. So we try to reduce the amount of imp network impact when, when we have a WAN policy, and we try to push as much data and the best clarity across when we want the user experience policy. So let's see what the actual impact of these policy uh, implementations are. So uh, average bandwidth per app, again, what can, what, what can we do? The UX policy is on your left, WAN policy is on the right. As you can see, we've got 35% reduction in the amount of data that is being sent in a WAN policy. Right. Uh, so coming to the next phase of it, we all know HTX is a pipe. It's a, it's a set of protocols. All of these protocols have individually defined policy parameters, and each of these are built in a separate way. Today, I'll be talking to you more about the adaptive display, why that makes a difference. So in, till now, we had this one thing called thin wire, and that was the way that we used to do the video compression as well as the image compression on the screen. But now we've moved away from that, or we're using that as one piece of it, as well as putting in what we call as adaptive display. So what is adaptive display? Adaptive display is, the, is our way of understanding what is being presented to, to the user and what they're seeing on the screen. So this is a web page, standard web page. So we'll look at what all it is made of. The first thing is in the green bar, box, you'll see it's a video. You've got in the red JPEG images as well as static text in the blue, right? So if we understand and we compress everything in the same level, you'll get very, very different results and the amount of data that is getting pushed over to the endpoint will be much, much more. So we understand what is being displayed on the screen, and we are able to compress it based on that. And we use different protocols for each of these sections. So H.264 is our primary method for doing compression for video and graphics. That will give you a really good uh, video performance. We use Thinwire Plus, which is the maximum compression for images. And then we go with overlay of lossless for text, so it's not blurry at all. You don't have fatigue, and you're able to clearly read the uh, text on the screen. Now, as you can see, text is lossless. What happens when we actually move to a screen that's completely text? Everything needs to be compressed individually and sent across, right? Well, that would cause a lot of data to be sent over. A standard financial screen, people will be looking at lots and lots of numbers. So what we built was uh, something called glyph detection, where we figure out that this piece of information is being repeated across the screen. And we look at it, we, compare, we understand that this doesn't need to get sent over again, and we are able to replicate that on the endpoint. Therefore, you get 16x better rate of transmission. So a fourth of a second versus four seconds for this particular screen and you get 91% less bandwidth and 30% better uh, what do you say, bandwidth consumption than even RDP and its own uh, system uh, glyph detection. 
right? Also, finally, what that provides to you is your customers who are in van scenarios will be able to have a local experience rather than one where everything is jagging or it's moving slowly when you're scrolling up and down a Excel sheet like this. Another thing that we have built is H.264 built to lossless. This is a really cool technology where you have a user that wants to it graphics intensive workloads, but then there's a lot of interaction that's also happening. So if we try to present everything in the same uh, quality while the user is interacting with the model, then you're pushing so much data that the system itself is not able to get that amount of network bandwidth uh, and push the same amount. So what we do is, while the user is interacting with the model, we reduce the quality, and when they finally actually end up in the point where they want to look at it, that is where we take it to the complete uh, pixel-perfect uh, picture. Right? So here, what it will give you is almost 2x more interactivity, or with the same interactivity, the images that are being built will, will build up to their pixel-perfect uh, scenario within half the time. So, and that is available in 7.18 or later. So let's see what the impact of the CVAD releases are on the actual HDX uh, uh, performances. This is the amount of data that is being sent for the knowledge worker, and we're using the UX policy here. So as you can see, individually, each of them are almost the same, and we will try to improve them as we go. And the final one is the best. Like 1903, we've always been improving. And you'll see why in a bit. Again, this is the experience, work, experience uh, policy for the UX work, for the, your knowledge worker. Now, when you set the van policy, as you can see, almost half of the content is being, I mean, the bandwidth is being consumed because of the policy reducing the amount of content that is being sent. Now, we added glyph caching in 7.13, and we added glyph caching the version 2 in 7.18. So, now let's take a look at, right now we saw, till now, everything that we saw was a knowledge worker. Let's see the task worker workload where all of, the uh, workload in VSI is more towards Excel sheets and your op in email management. And as you will see, as soon as we put glyph caching in, it drops a hell of a lot, right? Because there's no, that all of that input that was going through just wipes out from the screen, right? So glyph caching version two, that's where you want to be, or further at least, all right. So, thank you. <laughs> so this was adaptive transport, and adaptive transport, I mean, adaptive display works on top of what we call adaptive transport. And here, the ability to, uh, it uses what we call enlightened data transport, which is using UDP, or reliable UDP, as we call it. But what happens in a scenario where the user is not able to get UDP because there is some way that there's a firewall rule or there is, uh, the ports are blocked and not, you can't get UDP. So then if that is the case, then the user will not be able to get the screen at all. So in version one, what we did was we looked at trying to make a connection from the endpoint to the VDA using EDT. If that failed multiple times, then we would try TCP. So in version one, this was a, a, a synchronous process and it would slow down the actual uh, log on times as well as make the user wait for this, for this to happen. So what we've done in version two is we've actually added a mechanism where it simultaneously tries to connect via TCP as well as our EDT. If in any case it doesn't find TCP, I mean EDT, it will connect via TCP and it will continue to try and connect via EDT. If in, in the case that you get the option to connect via EDT, then it will seamlessly transition to EDT and therefore you will get the benefits that we talked about already. And you need to know, understand that none of this is ever visible to you or the end user. It's all done automatically and it's adaptive. So it looks at the correct, uh, it looks at the network conditions and it does it automatically. Next, as we see the single server scalability between TCP and EDT, there's no difference. You could be using either one, for you it makes no difference. On the bandwidth side, what you will see is there is a 15% uh, 
uh, requirement more on the van side because there is there will be some requirement for re uh, transmitting the data based on the uh, it being a UDP network based network and taking more data once it doesn't reach there. All right. Last but not least, we've added something else. What could that be? Till now, we've been looking at everything that is using a standard network pipe with the best conditions possible, OK? Which is, well, best as in, for the last 30 years, we've been working with something that baselines to 2 Mbps as a network requirement. But in reality, it always changes. You, the content that you're pushing, somebody watching something else on, the, on, the, on that particular pipe or something else happening during that, network conditions change. And we've added something called adaptive throughput. Here, we're actually looking at what is current state of the network and changing the protocol as well as the network compression and parameters to make sure that the user gets the same interactivity and the best user experience possible. So what really happens in a network where you're also watching a YouTube video and trying to do the same work, your buffers are too low, and the amount of data that we want to push through at the same time is not going through, and you'll have a bad experience. In a scenario where you have a really great network, but we are not pushing enough data, you're not consuming the pipe as well as it's going to reduce the amount of data that's getting pushed, and for lower video quality, lower uh, interactivity. So what do we do? We actually keep looking at the current network conditions. We measure round trip every four seconds, and we have a we have a default value of 400. If it goes over 400 any uh, for four consecutive times, we will drop the output buffers to 100. And and based on further tests, if it increases, then we will push them back up. And all of this is again underneath the covers. You don't have to worry about it. We will do it for you. Make sure that the users have the best experience. So what does this actually translate to in the real world? As you can see, without optimization, everything is below the 2 Mbps mark. None of the data being pushed can actually make it through, even if there is pipe available. But in the, after the optimization we've built in, you could push a lot more data. So as one of our customers have told us, they have, uh, they have a roving operation where they need to go to 22 different locations across the year. And all of their data needs to be uh, managed at their headquarters. And they act actively look at what is happening in the real world with 1080p, 60fps video content. Without this, it was not possible at all. With this, they have been able to push, because they've got really big pipes, they get 1080p simultaneous 60fps 60 uh, performance across all of their users. So, what we look at with the adaptive display, I mean, are the other throughput improvements are, if you're trying to copy a 400 MB file from the server to the client, we get 2x benefit. And this is the kicker. From client to server, it almost got to 17x improvement. All right? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm the co-presenter from Hell. I added a <laughs> surprise slide to your deck. Um, we had a, we had a, um, this, sorry for that. Um, we had a, we had this, uh, we had this, um, you might remember the keynote when we said um, we do a lot less, or we require a lot less, uh, uh, lot less spending per user when going into cloud, compa us compared to our friends at VMware. And the question was like, how the hell did you get to that? Um, essentially, this is really a simple test. Lock in BSI again. Uh, uh, in this case, I think it was the, what was it? I think the oh, task worker, knowledge worker. And essentially, what you, what you see is on the left hand side, the four bars on the left-hand side. This is a D3v2 instance. The blue bars is Citrix. The green bars is VMware um, with the BLAST protocol, which really performs bad. It has a great graphics quality for video content, but as soon as you go off the video content into any kind of text, they still use the video codec, the H.264 codec, to encode anything. And H.264 encoding is really, really, really performance intensive. And you have seen my young with all the things, how we decompose the desktop. They don't have this intelligence at the moment. So it's all or nothing for them, which results in a significant drop. So we can get almost double the number of users onto, onto a system in cloud. Um, and hence, we have half the spending. So back to you. Thank you. All right. So. We've been talking about a lot of things that have been only to do with CVID. But 
Citrix has so many other offerings as well. So what do we do when we actually integrate with our partner's uh, product like SD-WAN? We are able to have the ability to give you even better performance. How do we do that? Let's take the example of an enterprise internet. Normally what will happen is everything that is being going, goes through, in, going through the desktop has to go through the MPLS, goes back through back channels through the, uh, the data center and then hits the SAS sites and is there for inspection and all of those procedures. Everything needs to go back, uh, back haul to the traffic to the data center. Now what this causes is that single pipe that gets flooded with things that don't really need to hit it. So, what we can do if you've got SD-WAN is the ability to understand what the traffic is. So we can see exactly into the ICA protocol and figure out what data is being sent and how it needs to be optimized, as well as we can ma multi-channel that data across the MPLS, across a mobile LTE, or directly over the internet. And what these two devices will do between them, they will actually be looking on, the, in, on these different networks and understand the current network conditions and be able to figure out which is the best path for this data to be going over, right? So what will happen really is that we are able to see the ICA priority for each of the individual content that is being sent. So, Audio, which is the most important real-time communication, that needs to be the highest priority. Your graphics and video, which is the next priority, as well as file transfer and printing in different priorities. So we figure out where this data needs to go, under what channel, and we're able to actually figure out, without having to do any changes on the CVAD setup, the ability to push data across wherever it needs to go as the best channel possible. If you've got enough bandwidth, we'll send everything in MPLS. Otherwise, we will move it based on wherever it needs to go. So that would be the great value add that you will get with better together Citrix. And That's good. Awesome. So let's bring this home. Um, quick summary. And in the interest of time, uh, we keep this really short. So Windows versions, upgrading is great but it has a scalability impact, pay attention to that. Um, if you optimize, don't over-optimize. Always keep in mind whatever optimization you add remove, gets you away from the standard and only the standard is being tested, right? Microsoft is not testing any, any crazy optimizations, neither do we do. So the more you optimize, the more the chances you get into a configuration area which uh, is uh, out of bounds and if there's a problem, you have to revert back to the standard. So keep that in mind. It's always like this trade-off, like more servers versus more challenges with troubleshooting. Um, uh, optimizer is a great thing for optimization. Get to start. Give WEM a, a go if you don't, if you haven't tried it so far. And um, yeah, HDX. We, our wizards in the engineering department work constantly on making HDX better. They have a lot of. There's a lot of amazing wizardom in, in it, the wizardness in it. I don't know if this is a word. Um, it's 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 great, but you have to adopt to latest current release, right? All of that is 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 going is going there. And SDVAN, the combination of HDX and SDVAN, and our ability to look into the network characteristics as well as the HDX uh, uh, traffic is, is, a, is, a, is a combination which no other vendor really can, can provide. All right, so if you haven't seen Tech Zone yet, this is where all uh, the cool technology, uh, all, the, all the documentation, all the guidance around design and sizing and whatnot goes there. So rule of five and 10, for example, all, is, all of that is uh, documented there. And it's actually very soon it's being open to public to contribute. So uh, keep, an, keep an eye open on that. And if you like the graphic of the, on the sticker, go to the Citrix booth and you will find a few of those stickers there. Um, please, uh, yeah, before you leave, um, his Geek's Guide um, session uh, about multiple ways to deliver a desktop is coming up tomorrow. They're, more, they're all next door, so go there, check it out, and please rate the session. Thank you very much. <laughs>